It's amazing. Seems to be working. Anyway, back to attendance now that we're recording. Abigail's not here. Kincaid's not here. Andrea's not here. Mullins, not here. Lewis, it's not here. Cooper, not here. Hunter is here in WBSU gear. So a little extra credit for that. Melton, not here. Crowder, not here. Reinhardt, not here. Um, Melton, not here. Um, sorry, as a reminder, make sure you guys are logged into your WVSU email accounts if you tried to join online. Um, right now, it's no problem because I just saw that somebody tried to join. I let them in. But if I'm in the middle of the lecture and you're like 30 seconds late, I won't see it. And then you'll have to miss out on it. We don't need that, especially considering how far behind we are. Anyway, back to attendance. Julia is online. Talbert is not here. Kennedy's not here. Okay, just checking. Um, Kylie is online. Larissa is not here. Madeline is here in person. Hughes, I think I saw was online. Yep, is online. Galloway, not here. Cook is here. Durgan is here. Is that? I thought that was WVSU gear, is it? I'm not wearing my glasses. No, okay. It's the colors. It looked like it. Um, Tate is online. Burton is online. Kinder is not here. Jones is not here. Canterbury hey, is here. Hobson is here. Fisher is online. I think I'll go back to the top here. Abigail is here. Kincaid's not here. Andrea's not here. Mullins is not here. Lewis is not here. Cooper is not here. Both Meltons are here. Have I missed anybody? Well, we've still got about a minute left. Uh, well, it's eight. So let me see. We close this. I'm gonna wait till eight oh one before we get started. Technically, no one's late until eight oh one, I guess. And I don't blame anybody for not even coming in today. Like, let me just stay back and see if this records. See if there's any other natural disaster or technical difficulties. Did anybody get to see the full total eclipse? Anybody? But you guys saw it here, though, right? So it was like partial, like 98% or something. Wasn't it pretty close? No? 93? Oh. Did, did you feel the temperature change? 
we were in Dayton. It was noticeable because it was hot and miserable. And then it got chilly. Anyway, it's 801. Let's get started. So you guys have spoken. I think this is a good plan. We're just going to keep going. We're not going to do extra lectures. We're just going to keep going like nothing happened, except I'm going to go very quickly. It's going to suck a little bit. But the good news is, you know, if you look at that document, and I'll, if you don't know the document I'm talking about, send me an email and I'll send it to you. The document that has all the list of lectures, right? So if I do a lecture like today, for example, and I'm going like so quick, and you're like, what did he just say? Then if you want, well, you can meet with me and I'll redo the lecture for you slowly if you want. Or you can go to that document and you know how I'll post what chapters we did. You just scroll down that document and I go to last semester and watch the lecture I did back then. Does that make sense? So if I'm too fast for you today, you can go watch the slower, earlier, earlier version. So that's what we're going to do. All right, let's jump into it. Um, stop sharing that. Start sharing this. We're going to finish up very quickly chapter nine because the last thing we only have prions are the last thing we have to talk about. Um, and those are really simple. And I believe we talked about them before when we talked about proteins. So that part will be very quick. Then we're going to jump directly into chapter 11. So to be clear, we are skipping chapter 10. I never planned to do chapter 10. The only reason it even says chapter 10 on Moodle is because I'm thinking maybe one day I might do the PowerPoint and all that and have that as extra credit for future students. But right now, everything under chapter 10, even though it says chapter 10, all those links are for chapter nine. So we're skipping chapter 10, going straight to chapter 11. Um, and I know I said this in the announcements, but just definitely wanna make sure you know, all due dates from last week have been extended until this week. Not that it'll be been that picky anyway. Now I may have emailed you something and said, hey, this is due, this was due on Friday or whatever, and given you the dates that it should have been done. But, you know, if you're late, we've been dealing with a lot. Don't worry about it. Just do the best you can. But make sure my, you prioritize doing the stuff, the old stuff. You know what I mean? Like if you haven't done lab nine, make sure you do that before you do lab 10. And I'll just extend the due dates if needed. We're good? All right. First word for attendance. The first official word for attendance for you guys. This will be extra credit for you guys online. Make sure you send it because this is your attendance. Will be, let's say, brain the first word for attendance that word right there so anyway back to this lecture the end of chapter nine the, um chapter nine was obviously about molecular biology so we talked a lot about genetics from the molecular point of view like how dna is replicated and how we go from dna to rna to protein so to catch you up then we start talking about viruses and non-infectious diseases um and we've talked about viruses that was the last thing we talked about before we we left weeks ago um, and then this is the last non infectious or excuse me, it's an infectious particle, but it's um, not a virus. It's called a prion. What is a prion? It's an infectious protein. Now, as far as the exam is concerned, that's all you really need to know. We could just leave it at that. It's an infected protein. If you get any questions about prions, that's what it's going to be. But just so you know, prions cause brain disease. We talked about this earlier in the, in the uh, semester. I gave you a list of the different diseases like mad cow disease, obviously for cows, um, chronic wasting disease for things like deer kuru for things like human and that was um, spread by cannibalism um, so what happens is you get a cell that has a normal protein and it's uh it's i don't want to say attacked but exposed to this prion and then then that one also gets misfolded and that might not sound like much but go oh, who cares it's just misfolded but remember this whole form and function thing is something we see in biology a lot especially when we're talking about proteins right proteins are all about the shape so obviously if you're um misfolding a protein, you're changing its complete function. And not only that, but in this case, it actually puts little holes in your brain, which if you look up the actual word for, um, for example, mad cow disease, it basically means holes in the, in the brain. Anyway, any questions about prions? All right. Oh, yeah. So here's the list again. Here's some, some examples. Again, I'm not going to test you on any of this. If anything, you just need to know that prions are an infectious, misfolded proteins. Um, but yeah, these are some examples. And if you want to, you can look up more examples or you can write about any of these for independent work, which is technically past due. But again, we've been dealing with a lot. So do what you got to do. Um, scrapping and sheep, chronic wasting disease, like, disease, like I already mentioned, mad cow disease that I already mentioned, uh, Kreutzfeldt jacob disease, which is like a different version of Kuru. Um, of course, it's spread differently, but those are just all examples. So any questions about prions? All right. Um, 
again, this PowerPoint was based off of the old textbook. So I kept this in there so anybody can read it if they want for the um, reading the PowerPoints. But I'm not going to test you on any of this at the end of any chapter where it says evolution connection. That's the thing from your old textbook. So read it if you want. Don't read it if you don't. And on that note, we are done with chapter nine. So let's jump into chapter 11, which is about evolution. Speaking of which, chapter 11, here we go. To me, this is where it really gets interesting. This is my favorite part of the semester is this point moving forward, which is odd because my thesis work was looking at RNA, mRNA. I extracted mRNA and I sequenced it and I was looking at what's called a transcriptome, which I could tell you about later. Um, but despite me having my thesis in that, my interest is mostly not in cellular stuff. I love stuff outside. So I don't like to know like how things interact in a cell or how cells interact with each other. I like to know how living things interact with each other. And that's from now on what we're talking about. We're, we're done talking about cells. We're now looking at the big picture. So here we go. Chapter 11, evolution and its process. So again, just like this last <clears throat> chapter, I based this PowerPoint off of the old textbook PowerPoint. So the information is the same. It's just given in a slightly different order. So just keep that in mind if you're one of those people who like religiously reads the textbooks, which good on you for, if you are. Um, keep that in mind as we move forward. I would usually I like to play this guessing game so we can have a dialogue, but we are in kind of a hurry. Um, again, your old textbook has these pictures and it's like, hey, what, how does this matter to our everyday life? Um, not, that some of, not that all of these do, but let's talk about it really quick. Obviously, that's a picture of like a cherry tomato or something. That's a normal thing you can see in the grocery store. But the point that your old textbook was trying to make is that that's what all tomatoes used to look like. All tomatoes used to be that size until humans got involved and created them to be larger. That's something called artificial selection. You're going to learn about that. Artificial selection is a type of evolution, which is a good time for me to remind you. Evolution is the big blanket thing we're going to talk about. Then there's going to be all these sub, little different subcategories. So again, artificial selection is a great example of a subcategory of evolution. Um, this kid's scratching his head. It's because he has head lice. Um, and that's another good example of natural selection, um, specifically in this case, pesticide resistance. So what happens is, as you know, or you might know, when the kid gets uh, lice, you can either shave their head and or give them lice shampoo. What is lice shampoo? It's basically uh, pesticides. So what happens is, you know, you apply the pesticides, you kill most of the lice. But sometimes there was something genetically different about a few of them, and they survived that first onslaught of uh, pesticides. And because of that, whatever was ever up with their genomes that allowed them to be uh, immune to it, well, when they recreate and when they procreate and reproduce, then their offspring should probably have the same genes that make them immune to the pesticide. So what we've done is created this pesticide resistant headlights. And we'll talk about that later in uh, chapter two. And then this, these are cheetahs. Um, what you're gonna learn later in this chapter is cheetahs nearly went extinct twice. Um, and because of that, they're still feeling the effects of it. You might think, oh, they rebounded. Even if their numbers have rebounded, they're still affected by it because their genomes have been affected. And we'll talk about that later in this chapter. So here we go. First thing we're talking about is the diversity of life. Now, in my old or the old textbook, this section was in just the same chapter as uh, the evolution chapter. But in the textbook you guys are using, it's a different chapter. So just to point that out, if you're following along in the textbook, this is actually chapter 12, this portion of uh, this PowerPoint. And then after we talk to that, we're going to jump back to chapter 11. And I know it seems like it's out of order and it is out of order, but please trust me when I say I think it's better. All right, taxonomy. I might ask you what taxonomy is. It is the branch of biology that um, deals with identifying, naming, and classifying species. All right, so when you hear someone say, oh, a new species of whatever was discovered, that's what we're talking about right there, right? Taxonomy is the branch of biology that deals with that, which brings us to something called the Linnaean system. That is a method of naming species. Um, it's a hierarchical classification of species into broader groups of organisms meaning it starts very specific and then gets a little bit broader, broader, and broader. We do this naturally as humans and we don't even think about it. Um, you know, think about like, a, I don't know, motor vehicles, right? So you might get very specific and say, I drive an F-150 XLT, right? That's very specific. And then a little bit broader, there's different versions of F-150s. But then getting even broader, there's different Fords, right? And then get even broader, there's different versions of American-made vehicles, right? You see where I'm going, right? It starts very narrow and gets very broad. And we do the same thing with the Linnaean system. 
Um, so let me back up really quickly, just really quickly. If, if anything's going to be on the exam from this slide, it will be that first thing about knowing what taxonomy is. Now, I'm going to tell you more about the Linnaean system that you will need to know, but there won't be necessarily any questions about what's on the board right there about Linnaean system. That's just the introduction to what we're about to talking about, talk about, which is naming and classifying the diversity of life. So going back to the Linnaean system, here's what you need to know. Um, it's a Latinized name usually. It's two parts always. And that's why we call it sometimes a binomial because it's a two-part name. First part of the name is the genus, and the second part is the species within that genus. So the first part, when we write it, it's always capitalized, right? That first word is always capitalized. And the second word is always lowercase, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So yeah, I won't take any questions yet. I'm gonna go to the next slide before we finish this conversation and ask, take questions. But there we go, those two parts together. Again, that's a scientific name. So it's Panthera partis, and that's just an example. I'm not actually going to ask you questions about that, but that's just one example. But again, notice it's in italics, right? Um, species names are, or scientific names are in italics. The genus is over uh, uppercase, and the species is undercase. Um, yeah. So any questions about that? Probably I'm not even going to test you on that. Um, but there will be a question where I give you some, and there's a question like this on the study guide. Where I give you some names. Well, you should remember that the first word is the genus, right? So you would say. Panthera. Or you would say, if I ask you specifically what species is Panthera part, you would say part because the second word is part. Does that make sense? A lot of people up here. I'm from down south, so it makes a little bit more sense. Does anybody know what that is? I mean, fish. Does anybody know what kind of fish that is? Well, it's right there. <laughs> so it depends on where you're from. You might have different words for it, right? So when I the keys, we called it dolphin. Even in the uh, the menus at the restaurants, it said dolphin. But then that freaked people out because they would think dolphin like the porpoise. So they changed it to a word that already existed, which and that used to be a word that they would use like the Pacific, like a. Uh, uh, Hawaii and places like that. So we just adopted that name. But again, that's one name for it. Um, Dorado is the Spanish word for it. Cheetah is the Japanese word for it. Point being, this is why we have scientific names. So no matter where on earth, or if you're a scientist and you're dealing with species, you have the same word, right? You're not dealing with these common words that can be different from one to the other. So really quickly, and put an X through this as an indication that I'm not going to test you about the scientific or uh, common names of the, of the Mahi Mahi. Um, the Linnaeus introduced this system of grouping uh, species into hierarchical categories. Your book points that out, so did I, but I'm not going to ask you who did it. So that first bullet point is not important as far as the exam is concerned. This is not a history class. I do wish we had a bio class, but we don't. Um, taxonomy extends to progressive broader categories. So again, the most specific you can get is species. And then above that, you have genera, uh, the genus, which is you know a little bit more broad. And then you have families, and then you have, and then you have classes, phylum, kingdoms, and domains. This is what you need to know for the exam. You need to know those back and forth in that order. Um, hold on, I might need to come back to the slide. No, this is the slide you need to look at. So again, those are just examples: the eukarya, animalia, chordata, mammalia, carn carnivora. You don't need to know that. What you do need to know is the order, right? The most broad category is the domain. Then you get a little bit more specific. You go kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You need to know that in that order back and forth. Because there might be just a question where I say, what comes, what is broader than an, a class or a family? Well, a class is broader. Or I might say, what is more specific than an order, class or family? And then you would say family. Does that make sense? All right, make sure you know that for the exam. And again, this example, though, you don't need to know anything about this animal being the animal, Cordata, Mammalia. You don't need to know that. Um, yes, yeah, so there is another question. Nah, I won't even cover it. Make sure you do the study guide. If you have any questions about the study guide, let me know, because there is a question that kind of deals with this, not this example, but the specific idea. 
getting broader and more specific and vice versa. So when you see it, if it's hard for you, let me know, I'll help you. So any questions about this? Again, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, species. Also, if you were to look this up, this is just like, right? It also gets, there's also something called um, like a subclass for order, right? So there's also in between categories that we don't even teach for this 100 level non-biology major course. Point being is, this is what I'm gonna teach you. This is what I'm gonna test you on throughout your life. It'll help you just keep in the back of your mind that this is the basic version. And there is a slightly more version that has a little bit in between categories. Here's another picture from a different textbook. Same thing, right? So again, domain, kingdom, phylum. Oh, it's a good example. Subphylum, right? Which I'm not gonna test you on. Um, class, order, genus, species. But I do like this picture, that's why I included it, because it shows all the different things, right? So if you're just talking about mammals, there's all these different types of mammals. If you talk about animals, there's all those different types of animals, so on and so forth. All right, so the criteria to place them in these different uh, categories is ultimately arbitrary, meaning humans decide, right? I mean, a group of people do it, and they do have some sort of a um, system that they use to do it. But ultimately, it is arbitrary because the system we use was also created by human, right? So after you learn about the processes by which the diversity of life evolved, we will then introduce the classification system based on the understanding of evolutionary relationships. Meaning, so yes, it is arbitrary, but now that we know evolutionary relationships and now that technology or with the, the way we can sequence genomes, we're starting to rearrange things. Usually they're not big things like Graph isn't going to be rescheduled or reclassified from a mammal to a reptile or anything, but there are some things getting shuffled around towards the bottom, more specific areas. If you download the PowerPoint, you can click this uh, link and watch a video about taxonomy. Nothing on this slide will be on the exam. This is just kind of letting you know, hey, this is all arbitrary, but it's getting better as tech. Another thing you definitely need to know, this is going to be throughout the rest of the semester. We're going to talk about species a lot because like i said we're done talking about cells for the most part we're looking at the big picture matter of fact species will be the next word for attendance anyway what is a species it is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding individuals so for example well yeah i'll just leave it at that for now one species is distinguished from another by the possibility of matings between individuals from each species to produce fertile offspring. So in other words, if they can't can't mate and produce you know, fully functioning offspring, then However, there are some um, some exceptions to that rule. You can look them up for independent work. For example, and I don't know exactly which one, but you guys are the liger cross between a lion and a tiger. Then there's also the other version, which is a tigon. Anyway, so there's two different versions, right? You can cross a lion and a tiger, which are two different species. And if I remember correctly, it, well, definitely at least one of them produces offspring, but they're not fertile. And if I remember correctly, the other version might produce a fertile offspring, but I don't remember. You can look it up for, um, for independent work. But generally speaking, this is the criteria we use to define species and say, all right, this is one species. So any questions about that slide? All right, so that brings us to something called speciation. Like, how do we get these different species? How do we have, like, why do we have these two closely related species? Why aren't they the same species? Well, it's probably because they came from a common ancestor, and then speciation occurred. And what is speciation? It is the formation of two species from one original species. Now, sometimes you might have one original species that turns into two new species. That looks horrible, I hate this screen so much. Or you might have one species that remain the same species, but then also split off to form two, uh, new, one new species, right? So you might keep one old one, get one new one, or you might have two completely new ones. But here's something you'll probably need to know for the exam. I should say probably, maybe. I'm gonna say I might ask you about these things. But there's two different types of speciation that we're gonna talk about separately. But this is your introduction to them. The first one is called allopatric speciation. And that involves the geog geographic separation of populations. And then there's some other words we're going to talk about later, dispersal. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. 
but most importantly for the exam, because I probably ask you that, if I ask you anything, just know what allopatric speciation is. It involves graphic separation of populations. And again, on the coming up slides, we'll talk more about it. The other one is called sympatric speciation, and that is speciation within a parent while remaining in one location. So basically allopatric, different places, sympatric, same place. Any questions about this so far? Um, here's an example. I think I did not get these pictures from the textbook. I think I took them somewhere else. I don't remember. But if you can, I'm going to go through the geology lesson. Not that you need to know the geology of this, but this is just an example. So what's happening on the West Coast and many other places of the Pacific North, you've got this one plate that's underwater. You can't it's a plate, but it's crashing into the North American plate, right? It does, as you might imagine, is it causes mountains, right? Imagine two huge land masses crashing. That's actually what causes, for example, the Himalayan Mount Everest. That's what, what caused it. That's what caused the mountains. Anyway. Imagine back in the day, this used to be a big flat area. So imagine you had just a bunch of species. Uh, I don't know, pick whichever animal you want or plant. Plant might be even better. Anyway, this happens. Then this mountain, front, mountain range forms. So now we have, I don't know, let's just choose some sort of plant. We got one species of plant, another species of plant, or the same species on this side of the mountain. At first, maybe they were the same species, but after generations and generations and generations, they're going to be different. And this is kind of a geology lesson here. What happens is all this weather comes in from the It's got a lot of moisture in the air, obviously, because it's coming from the Pacific. It hits Seattle, it hits this, and it generally can't get over it. So what happens is it gets dumped. And if you think of Seattle as a like a rainy place, now you know why. It's because that moisture can't get over that mountain range. So for that reason, for example, that Seattle area is very, very wet. A area over here on the other side is very, very dry. So again, you may have started with one, but then things changed. So within those different groups of plants of the same species, they're they're dealing with different things. So now, generation after generation, a few individuals in the species that are really good with being wet, they survive. They passed on their genes. The ones that are not really good at being wet on this side, on the other side, the one died, right? But the one that would be in dry, they survived and passed on the genes. After generations and generations and generations, eventually they're just going to be different species. And that's just one example. I really oversimplified it, but that helps you uh, visualize what we're saying here. For allopatric speciation, right? It was that geographic separation that made the difference. And there's so many of this you can look into, like islands and new rivers, new lakes. Think. Anyway, any questions about that? It's just an example. I'm not going to ask you about the cascades or anything about the, the weather stuff I just talked about or the geology stuff. Then we have something called active radiation. I'm probably not going to ask you about this, but I might. So another question mark. That is when the population of one species is throughout an area. Um, and then finds a distinct niche, isolated habitat. And formally, to talk about that later. Niche is like their job, so to speak. Niche is like they eat or where do they sleep? You know, the, the thing ecosystem, right? What's their job, so to speak. And again, we'll talk about it later. Um, and all this results in varied demands of their new lifestyle leading to multiple speciations of it. So again, Patrick speciation. We're still talking about speciation due to being separated, but in this case, instead of like geology causing the separation, like I just showed you with with that the formation of that mountain range. Here, it's them kind of separating themselves, right? They're just kind of moving away and going to different spaces. So imagine some, I don't know, bird species coming to Florida and it starts in Florida and then works its way out to the rest of the United States. It might eventually become a different species as some of them stay in that wet, damp Florida and some of them might go to, I don't know, the dry Southwest, right? Some of them might go to really cold Northern spots. So because of that adaptive radiation, they'll turn into different species or could turn into different species. Anyway, any questions about that side? Woo. Um, another part, sympatric speciation, right? So we're no longer talking about allopatric speciation. We're no longer talking about uh, 
geological differences or the separation, the physical separation causing it. Now we're talking about chromosomal errors, right? Chromosomal errors during meiosis or the formation of an individual with too many chromosomes might cause a new species. So this is stuff you already know about. We talked about this when we talked about meiosis. We said there are errors, right? Sometimes something, some individuals are born with too many chromosomes. Sometimes they're not born with enough. We know from the human examples, sometimes that can cause a disorder. Sometimes it has no effect at all. Like if you think about some of those um, chromosomes, abnormalities we talked about, sometimes it's deadly, right? So I told you some of it, the, the fetus wouldn't even be born. But sometimes, and not with humans, not yet, sometimes for some species, that mistake might just create a whole new species. Right? So it makes this mistake. These offsprings are born with this mistake, and it just might be completely healthy. But since it has a different number of chromosomes, it generally cannot mate with the original species, right? So that, again, going back to the definition of species, different species. And that brings us to this word, which, once again, I probably won't ask you about. But we've talked about, think about going back to the meiosis chapter, we talked about diploid, which is what we are, right? We have two of each chromosomes. We talked about haploid, which is what our sperm and our eggs are, right? Our gametes, they only have half of that number. Now here's a polyploidy. That's when a cell or an organism, organism has extra sets of chromosomes. So technically, trisomy 21 that we already talked about, uh, Down syndrome, right? That was technically polyploidy, right? That was when that individual has an extra chromosome. So any questions about this slide? Okay. Um, this is from your textbook. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember what the example was from, from, the, from your textbook. But probably, so given what we just talked about, uh, probably that was an example of maybe one species. Probably one of these has an extra chromosome, and now they're technically different species. But if I am correct, doesn't matter. It was just an example, and I don't generally test you on examples. All right, let's talk about explaining the diversity of life. Here we go. The explanation, like, right, basically, you know about sympatric speciation now, you know about allopatric speciation now, but let's kind of look at it from a different lens. The explanation of the origin of the diversity of life is basically evolution, right? That's evolution is the reason we have all this diversity. And I will say this because I know some people are religious. And um, first of all, I'm not telling you you have to believe this. But I am telling you, you have to know this because I'm going to test you on this. And you can't really say you don't believe something if you don't know it. Right. So anyway, you're going to have to learn it. Um, another thing to say is, again, if you're religious, you might think of it as. I don't like to give my opinions, but why not? So I won't say how religious I am, but I do believe there's some sort of higher power. And in my mind, all the stuff I'm about to teach you did happen. But in my mind, there's had to been or not had to been, but. Maybe there was some sort of higher power pushing towards it. It doesn't mean not, it's not what I'm teaching you. What I'm teaching you tells you this could happen completely random. I'm saying that's my thoughts. Anyway, one last thing before we jump into it. One of the most hot button topics in this course, this and climate change. So again, I'm not telling you what you have to believe. I'm just telling you what you have to know. And if you feel like questioning it, I recommend questioning everything I teach you. So if everything you, I'm teaching you here, if you don't believe it, look it up for yourself for independent work. But again, we don't have time to teach all the alternatives because everything I've taught you so far this semester, not everything, but so many of them actually do have other alternatives. So in a bio one-on-one class, we teach you what is generally accepted. But one semester is not enough time to talk about all the possible awesome, um, different theories. Anyway, all that out of the way, let's get into talking about evolution. It was proposed by Charles Darwin. I'm not going to ask you that, but we will talk a lot about Charles Darwin. He proposed it in this book called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, which was published in 1859. I'm not going to ask you that. Um, but he was not the first person to try to explain the origins of this uh, life. And we're going to talk about that very quickly because I'm not going to test you on any of that. But it does explain a little bit, like, how did we get to what we know now? So first, there was this idea of a, of a fixed species. That's what they used to think back in the day. Some people still do. Aristotle, for example, was one person. That's what the old textbook said. Your textbook says Plato. I'm sure if you look up the sources, you might even find Socrates. I don't know. Anyway, let's just say ancient Greeks. Ancient Greeks um, said that the species are fixed permanent forms that do not change over time. That was the leading thought for a long time. 
even now, people who don't believe in evolution, you have to admit species are changing over time. We see them changing over time. And I'll give some examples later of that. And you can read them in your textbook. Species in our lifetimes have changed over time. Um, then we moved past that and we came to the Judeo-Christian culture, which reinforced that idea with a literal, literal interpretation of Genesis. Obviously, I'm not going to ask you any about that. But if you read, if you were to read it, you know, it says, hey, everything was created like this and nothing's changed. Right. And again, we know that's not we know that's necessarily true, um, especially when it comes to dinosaurs. Right. Not only have they changed, they've gone extinct. If you download the PowerPoint, you can click on that little head bust of uh, Aristotle. Species that they used to believe. And then if you click down on that bottom right, when you can get about the Judeo-Christian uh, interpretation of Genesis or the creation of life or everything for that matter. Any questions about this slide, which is according, uh, as far as the exam is concerned, not very important. All right. So then in the 1600s, religious scholars estimated the earth was about 6,000 years old. I'm telling you now, that's not how old the earth is, but that's what they thought back in the 1600s. That's what they figured out. That that's how old they thought the earth was. Species came into being relatively recently at 6,000 years might sound like a long time, but not that we now that we know that the earth is billions of years old, 6,000 years is nothing. Um, but back then, that was the thought, right? And it dominated for centuries. And again, in some cultures today, it still does dominate. Some people still don't believe that the earth is older than 6,000 years old. Some people still don't believe that animals, uh, dinosaurs existed and went extinct or didn't uh, exist, for example. Anyway, while all this was going on, we had naturalists, which are just a certain type of scientist, grappling with the interpretations of fall. Right? So all these things, like, all right, well, nothing's changed. But then they're fine. Well, how does that work out? If nothing's changed, why do we have fossils that look different than things that are alive today? Similar, but different. Fossil, um, I'm probably not going to test you on the definition of it, but I'm going to use the word a lot. No, I might Anyway, a fossil is the imprint or remains of an organism that lived in the past. Imprints or remains, right? So it could be bones, could be hardened poop, could be a footprint, all kinds of stuff. And we'll go back to talking about fossils, so I won't ask you if you have any questions about it yet. But I will later when we talk about them a little bit more. So, but are there any questions about this slide? It's relatively unimportant as far as the exam is concerned except that third bullet point that we're going to talk about later. All right. Fossils were thought to be the remains of living creatures back then, right? So, for example, that thing down there, they used to call those snake stones, and they thought that those were coiled bodies of snakes, right? But every time they found them, they had they were headless, right? They never found one of those that had a head, so it made so no sense to them, right? So, again, they thought those were dead snakes, but never could figure out that where, where all the head was. I bet they probably argued about it too. I wish I could have been there. Or I wish they had social media back then. They probably argued with each other. Like, you're, you lived hard. It's, you know, we, obviously something bit the head off. And then they'd respond like, oh, you Trump tard. Obviously, they're probably, you know, they probably would have argued like they do today, but they didn't have the ability to do that. But anyway, that's a snake stone. Just an example. I'm not going to ask you about snake stone. The point is, they're finding these fossils, and these fossils made them think about the, the prevailing thoughts of the day like is the world really only six thousand years old have species really not changed so that's the point that i'm getting at there with the fossils then there was other discoveries in the 1800s that included fossils of gigantic uh, for example the ichthyosaur which translates to fish lizard not that i'm going to ask you any of that this is just an example it can many scientists many people have extensions that occurred so not that i'm going to ask you this but that's about when it started happening in the early years finally scientists started to come around and like okay Obviously, there's been a whole bunch of species that have just gone missing, right? Um, but again, the date, I'm not going to ask you about that. I'm not going to ask you about the ichthyosaur, which is just an example, but yeah. And if you click that, again, if you download the PowerPoint and click that picture, it's actually a link to a little video that you can watch about the ichthyosaur. The next word for attendance, I'm going to underline it. I'm not going to say it, so that's it. I'm just giving you like you see anything like I'm giving you one example, you can look up other examples for independent work. All right. So again, just to remind you of the big picture of what we're talking about right now, step it back a little bit. We're talking about how Darwin did discover natural, well, 
first to explain natural selection and all that, but he wasn't the first, he was just the first to do it correctly. There was other peoples, right? So we already talked about uh, the ancient Greeks. We talked about the Judeo-Christian um, uh, religion. So now we're talking about some other, some other people, specifically a guy named Lamarck. And I'm almost definitely not going to ask you questions about him. All. Insight though, to what things were, were like back then. Oh, also, let me throw this out there too. Anytime I say I'm not going to ask you this question on the exam, uh, there's a possibility I might throw it out there as for extra credit. But if I say I'm not going to test you on it, that means you're not going to lose points for it. Anyway, naturalists were comparing these fossils to things that were alive, right? And they're looking at them like, all right, well, this looks similar to this species, this living species in this way, but it's also different in that way. So then in the early 1800s, there's this guy named Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, excuse me, or Lamarck for short. And he suggested that the best explanation for these observations is that life evolves. So even though this isn't a history class and I'm not going to teach you or test you about Lamarck, basically we consider him the first person to suggest that life evolves, right? He didn't get the method correct, but the idea that life does change, species do change, um, he's credited as being one of the first to uh, say that. He explained slash proposed that evolution is the refinement of traits that equip an organisms to perform successfully in their environment. True. We know that to be true today. It's the refinement of traits that equip organisms to perform successfully in their environment. So if you had a bunch of white moths and a handful of black moths, and then you cover everything in smoke, those handful of black moths all of a sudden have an advantage, right? So generation after generation, you're going to have more black ones surviving than white ones. So they're going to be the ones passing their genes down. And over time, that population is going to change. You're going to have eventually more and more and more moths in the population, right? Like you learned in lab. And that is an organism, but that is equipping an organism to perform successfully in their environment, right? Um, and we'll come back to that thought too, because we're still just talking about Lamarck, which I'm not going to test you on. So again, that part was correct, but he suggested how it happened, and that was not correct. He suggested that it happened by using or not using body parts, an individual may develop certain traits that passed on to the offspring. In other words, by his definition, you know, you have two people who work out all the time, they're really in shape, have really big muscles, and when they have offspring, they're going to be more likely to be big, big muscles, right? But that we know now that's not how it works, right? But that was the thought. Specifically, that was just an example I made up. His idea, one of his his actual examples was giraffes. He thought like a giraffe spent its all all of its day stretching its neck, trying to reach the leaves, but they do do that. But then he thought because they were stretching their neck together and had babies, that their babies would be slightly larger because they had been stretching their necks, right? And we not in case, and we'll explain how it happens later. But yes, so he, the idea that life evolves was. The mechanism of how it happened was a mistake. So his proposal that species evolve as a result of the interactions between the organisms and the environment was correct, and it did help set the stage for Darwin. So any questions about this slide? All right. So like go back to talk about him. Again, I'm using from the last textbook. I do like the last textbook for many reasons. Like about it is they tell it as a story. And it's a lot easier for me, in my opinion, to learn something as a story than like this point six, chapter two point seven, right? This anyway, Charles Darwin. He was born in eighteen oh nine on the same day as Abraham Lincoln, February something. I don't remember. I'm at, he was fascinated with nature as a boy, which makes sense considering what he's known for. I'm not going to ask you that either. Uh, he quit medical school, right? So he started medical school because again, he was kind of a scientifically branded, I guess you could say. But then he quit eventually because he found medicine boring. Like, so the actual academics of it, he found boring. And he found surgery horrifying, which makes sense. Because think about it. We're talking about when he was an adult. Because remember, he's the same exact age to the day as Abraham Lincoln. When he was an adult, think about like the Civil War times and surgeries. Horrifying. Not that he was here for that, but same time frame. And here's what I think is interesting. But again, too about it. He then, when he quit medical school, studied to be a clergyman. There's this big hot button. This is a big right between religion and science, and I hate it because I feel like they can coexist. And I don't have time for that right now. But 
it's not like he didn't know about religion, right? He studied to be a clergyman. So it wasn't like anti-religion, I don't want to call them anti-religion, but you might call them anti-religious views. It's not because he didn't know, he knew. He just also knew some stuff that he figured out on on the HMS Beagle, right? So when he was 22, he went around the world boat. We're gonna talk a little bit about his journey, but that journey helped the observations he, he, uh, he saw helped uh, bring him to where we are today. Anyway, none of that's important for the exam. It's like a prequel, so you know what, kind of where Charles Darwin came from. So let's talk about the journey. Um, not that I'm gonna ask you this, but why was he on the boat? What was the Beagle doing? Why was it going around the world? It was a survey ship, charting South American coast. Actually, he was making maps, or they were making maps all over the world. But for our story, we're more concerned about what happened in uh, South America. So when he spent his time on shore, you know, again, this is back in the day. So it's not like he was, you know, taking pictures and posting them to Instagram, right? He didn't have that option. So he explored, right? He explored all these new places. And also you have to imagine too, not this is important for the, uh, for the exam, but think about the difference between now and then, right? Now it means nothing for us to see a tiger or to see a llama or to see a lion. Like we've seen them on TV, we've seen them on the internet, we've seen them in, in zoos, right? All this stuff we're just used to seeing. We see these movies that take places, all the different, uh, take place in all these different places. Back then they didn't have that. At best, you have those crappy, you should look them up, those uh, drawings, right? Somebody from England who'd never been to Africa trying to draw a lion, right? It's silly stuff. So this, I mean, this would be exciting to me at this day, but back then it had to been even more exciting, right? This new world. He explored it. He collected fossils. He also collected living things, right? Living plants and animals. He kept detailed journals of his observations. And he noted characteristics of plants and animals that made them good to their diverse environments. So again, he was seeing, like, again, he went all over the world, even though we're just talking about South America right now. So he saw all these different environments and all these different things living in them, right? Deserts, um, mountains, islands. And yeah, we'll talk about it. Anyway, any questions about this slide? Trying to rush through it. This is one great example. So I'll talk about this here in a second, but he went to this place called the Galapagos Islands, which are a set of different islands. They're separate from each other. They're close enough to where birds could fly close, you know, back and forth, but generally speaking, they don't. More importantly, each of those islands, despite being kind of close to each other, they have different environments. So because of that, they have these different uh, bird species. And you can see they have different beaks. Your book goes into detail. I'm not going to ask you any questions about it. But it really is a good example, though, of how they have these different beaks because they have different environments. Therefore, they're eating different things. Like some of them might be eating insects. Some of them might be eating seeds. Therefore, their beak is very important to how they eat, right? Like birds don't have hands. They have to manipulate their food with their beaks. Um, so anyway, just an example. You can read about it. I'm not going to ask you any questions about those finches. But here's a here's a map of where he went. Again, I'm not going to test you on that. I find this very interesting because Darwin, Australia, is right around here, but he never even went there, so I don't even know why they call it Darwin. Anyway, you can see where he went. And then here's the Galapagos Islands. Let me really quickly say this because this is important to understanding how things may have worked. Um, I'm going to try to do it quickly though. So the Galapagos Islands are interesting in their distance from South America because they're close enough to set. Well, first of all, let me back up and say this. They're relatively new, right? South America has been there for a long time. The Galapagos Islands were formed by volcanoes relatively not that long ago. For us, it was a long time ago. But in the grand scheme of the, the history of Earth, they're relatively new. So you have all these things living on South America. Then boom, well, not boom, it took a while. Then those islands showed up. And when those islands were first formed, there was no life on them. Well, you know, no birds and plants and animals. Um, and is that distance is very important. Not that I'm going to test you on it, but it's close enough to South America that every once in a while, life would leave South America and make it to the islands, right? Now, maybe a bird was flying around and it normally couldn't make that distance, but there was a big storm and it blew it the other way, right? Or maybe some lizard that lives on South America landed on some raft of uh, palm fronds and it floated it over there. So that's the point. The point is it's close enough to where life can and did go from South America to the islands, but it's far enough away to where it's very rare for it to happen. And what I'm getting at is the fact that it's close enough explains how life did get there in the first place. 
but it's distance away. The, the fact that it's so far away explains why things changed on this island, right? Because once those animals and plants got there, they were in a different environment than they were to begin with in South America. And they weren't going back and forth and spreading their genes, right? Once they were there, for the most part, they were there. Keep that in the back of your mind. That'll be an important concept as we move forward for the next three minutes and some change. And then the islands themselves, um, you can't see it very well in this picture, but again, depending on the species we're talking about, some, some things could easily just go to all these islands. Some things like tortoises that we'll talk about later, if it's on an island, a big old tortoise, like literally this big, that thing's not going from that island to that island, right? It's too big to make the trip. So once again, allopatric speciation, right? So one species may have came over from um, South America and landed on these different islands. But even here on these different islands, they're separated from each other. So again, allopatric speciation. Let's talk about his observations. His observations indicated that geographic proximity is a better predictive relationship among organisms and similarity of environment. You do need to know that. Meaning, um, animals, just as an example, animals on the mainland of South America were more closely related to the animals and plants on the Galapagos Islands because they were geographically closer. And if you compared, uh, uh, contrast that to perhaps, I don't know, animals on the desert islands of the Galapagos Islands versus islands, or excuse me, animals in the deserts of Africa, for example, right? So they have the same environment, but they were really far apart geographically. So again, that's an important bullet point. It's that proximity to each other that makes them more similar, oddly enough, than their environment. And the why I say oddly enough is because to me that's counterintuitive in some ways. Because, remember, they're adapting to their environment, right? So you would expect things to adapt the same way. But they don't because they came from that common ancestor, right? So they're geographically closer. Therefore, they have a closer common ancestor. Anyway, any questions about that? Okay. Not, and I'm not going to test you about his observations, but this bullet point might be a te test question, knowing that geographic proximity is more important than similarity of, uh, of uh, environments. So again, this is, I'm not going to test you on this, but this is kind of uh, defending what I just said. The South American fossils he found were clearly examples of species that were different than things that were living, but they were also very similar, right? And I don't have time to go through all this, but you guys probably think you recognize all these, of course, the cartoons. But these are actually artist renditions of species that have gone extinct. So yes, that looks like a toucan, but that's actually an artist rendition of a species that's gone extinct. That looks like a capybara, but it's actually a species that's gone extinct. So again, he's looking at these species, he's looking at these fossils, he's looking at these things that are alive. He's like, wow, that looks just like this thing, except these major differences, right? So again, he's comparing and contrasting what's existing to what used to exist. Um, Dar was intrigued by the distribution of the, the, the organisms on the Galapagos Islands. I've already said this. I should have said it then instead of uh, earlier. But this is just talking about the thing I was talking about, about how far they are from the mainland. So I'm going to skip that. Um, again, these are examples I've already used with the iguanas and the tortoises. Obviously, iguanas can go back and forth between different places. Turtles can't. So, for example, those, uh, those uh, iguanas are the same on all the different islands but each island has a different tortoise. Because again, the iguanas can make it back and forth. The tortoises can't. Therefore, if they're on different islands, they're in different situations. And then we had uh, allopatric speciation and eventually they became different species. You can download the PowerPoint and watch some videos. There's a picture of a, one type of tortoise on one island, a saddleback shell on another island. Um, let's end it there. So I will be in lab today. You don't have to be because it's a virtual lab, but I'll be there if you need me at 10 and be there until well, 11.50. And that's it. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Last word for attendance will be lab since we're talking about it. And that's it. So I'll see you guys either next lecture or in lab. You too. So, again, if that was too fast for you, you know, <clears throat> go to that work, go to that sheet and you can watch the uh, the previous semester versions of those uh, those lectures where I was slower. Oh, yeah, it's a good time to remind you, too. You can get extra credit for that, just like anything else. Like when you're watching those videos, it's just like you're watching this, the attendance words. If you send me those attendant words or whatever, um, 
directions I give on those videos, you can get up to 2.4 points of extra credit for, for watching them. And that's it. Whoa.